People from all over the area came to hear John speak. He would often baptize those who decided to follow God, dunking them in a lake as a symbol of their choice. One day, Jesus came to John and asked him to be baptized. John said, I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you. But Jesus convinced him to baptize him. When he did, he saw the sky split open and the Spirit of God flew down like a dove and landed on Jesus. Then he heard a voice from heaven say, This is my Son, whom I love. After Jesus' baptism, John the Baptist told all who came to hear him that Jesus was God's chosen one, the Messiah. Then Jesus went out into the wilderness and withheld from eating or drinking for 40 days. There, the devil showed up and put Jesus through a series of tests. Despite the devil's efforts to get Jesus to stop trusting God, Jesus refused the temptations and the devil left. When Jesus returned from the wilderness, he selected 12 men to join him to minister throughout the area. These men, who were called disciples, became his closest group of followers. One day, when Jesus and his followers were attending a wedding feast, they ran out of wine. Jesus asked the servants to fill six large stone jars with water. When they did, the water miraculously turned into wine. This was just the first of many miracles that Jesus performed, showing his power and causing many to follow him. Jesus continued to travel across the area meeting with everyone from powerful religious teachers to the ordinary folks, telling them how they could live God's way and be saved from their sins. And the miracles continued. Jesus healed people with all kinds of illnesses and even helped a paralyzed man walk again. He spoke about a new kingdom that was very different from anything people had heard before. Many people were amazed. But some of the religious leaders were angry and fearful as his following grew. Before we start talking about the story, I just want to give a Vacation Bible School plug. You saw the video there. It looks exciting. We're excited about it. Kids can sign up today. So if you have your own kids, you have nieces, nephews, grandkids, or just find some kid on the street and sign them up. That'd be great. We want him here. We'd love to have a church full of kids to be able to hear the important message that's going to be presented through Vacation Bible School. There's two ways you can sign up in the foyer, but also online at our website at centerchristianchurch.org. And there's a little tab that you can register online. So please be praying about that. We're excited about that. Lana, what's the date? July 13th through the 17th. Mark it down and please help. We need lots of help for this. We want it to be an amazing time for these kids to grow in God. Now looking at the story, chapter 23, we're looking at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Now last week we talked about how Jesus is fully God. In every way, Jesus is the fullness of God. He was with God in the beginning. He is God. Today we're going to see how Jesus was also fully man. Jesus identified with us. Jesus set a path for us. And I don't know about you, but I need to know that Jesus has experienced everything that I experience in life. And Jesus made a way beyond that, beyond our enemy, beyond sin and temptation, to a life in which we are made right with God. It is all about righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's what I want to talk about today. But as you were reading the story, and if you have not been reading the story, there are still books available. You can catch up with us starting out in the New Testament because the way for you to get the most out of God's Word in this overview we're doing is by getting into the storybook, by attending Sunday school if you can, and by listening to the sermons. The sermons are not covering it all. Well, I'm just giving you an overview. But today, the story starts with, in chapter 23, talking about John the Baptist. 
John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was like the prophets of old in which he called the people to repentance and to be restored to God. But he was a little bit different, wasn't he? How many of you are wearing camel skin today? If you are, that'd be awesome. I should have, I should have put a, a challenge out on Facebook, you know. That would have been great. How many of you have had honey this morning? So, my wife had honey. Natasha, thank you. So honey's not bad. How many of you have had locusts this morning? Ugh. I remember the year of the cicada in Cincinnati. And everywhere you went, other people had it in their hair, but I didn't. But there was locusts everywhere. And I couldn't imagine just walking and going, click, click. Oh. No, that's gross. He was definitely out there, John the Baptist. He lived on the outskirts of society. But John the Baptist had a message. His message was calling people back to God. But not only that, John the Baptist was pointing to one that would come behind him. He was a herald, a messenger of the one that would come to fulfill God's upper story. And that is Jesus. Let's look at a passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 3. We're going to be looking at the, the gospel of Matthew today. Looking at chapters 3 and chapter 4. And we're going to start here in verse 11 because this is what... John the Baptist said about Jesus. This is what he said about Jesus. In Matthew 3.11, John says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And now we see Jesus, 30 years old, come on the scene. In Scripture, we've not heard anything about Jesus from being 12 years old to now to the point of 30 because it was all a part of God's plan for Jesus' ministry to begin. And it began in a specific way. And it began in a way that would forever change our relationship with God. So let's see the first thing here. We see that Jesus is pronounced... To be the Messiah at his baptism. Now Messiah is the same word as Christ. When you hear Jesus Christ, that is the same word. Messiah is the the Hebrew. Christ is the Greek. But it means the same thing. It means chosen one. It means the anointed one to fulfill God's plan of redemption. Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus, the Christ. At his baptism, he is pronounced to be the Messiah. Let's see these events unfold in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? I mean, imagine John the Baptist, is, he's baptizing people, and here comes the Messiah. And he's like, no way, I'm not baptizing you. You need to baptize me. But look at Jesus' response. Jesus' response in verse 15 says, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Now, he's not going to argue with Jesus. And so he is baptized by Jesus but certainly Jesus did not, to be bap- did not need to be baptized for repentance because Jesus was without sin. So why was Jesus baptized? That's an important question for us to answer. And I think that's found in Jesus, God who became flesh. God who became flesh. And we see that, that Jesus identifies himself with us. Through being baptized. Again, he was not baptized for repentance of sin. Jesus was not baptized to be made right with God because he was God. But we find the reason why Jesus was baptized in his response. Again, in verse 15, he said, It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Now, to set the stage here, there's a passage of scripture in Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 12, I'm sorry, chapter 12, verse 2, a little bit dyslexic this morning. So Hebrews 12, verse 2, where it reveals something very important for us to understand about Jesus, that Jesus is the forerunner of our faith, which means Jesus ran the race before us. The only way you and I 
can have faith in God is because Jesus ran the race before us. The only way we can be right with God or made righteous is because Jesus went before us. Jesus is the forerunner of our faith. That means that Jesus became like us in every way. He was fully man. Jesus cried. Jesus was sad. Jesus got upset and turned the tables over. Jesus was like us in every way. He hurt. He was disappointed. And the reason why that is so important for us to understand is that Jesus became like us in every way to lead us to God. He became like us in every way so that he could run the race of righteousness so we would know and follow him so we could be made right with God. And that's what we see in his baptism. Jesus was not being baptized for Jesus. Who is Jesus being baptized for? Us. Because Jesus showed us how to be made right with God. Jesus said to be right with God, you need to surrender yourself in baptism. Now, baptism means two things. For one, baptism means, anybody want to say what baptism means? I want to challenge you here. Not just dip or sprinkle. Immerse completely under, right? And don't stay under. That's not good. Out of the water. Immerse. The second thing that baptism means is to identify with. Now, the thing that we need to understand is Jesus identified with us. He identified with the path we need to take to be right with God. And so Jesus was baptized for us as an example for us. So we could say, I know how to be made right with God. And it is the path that Jesus laid before me. The other meaning of identify is that because Jesus identified with us, as fully man, and was baptized for us to see and to know that now we can be identified with Jesus and be identified with his death as we go in the water, his resurrection as we come out, because it is through Jesus Christ we are saved, through what he did for us on the cross, taking our sin, washing us clean, so we can be identified. Jesus was baptized for that to which he is identified with us, So then we could follow that path of righteousness. The second thing that we see here is found in Matthew 3, verses 16 through 17. And we see what follows Jesus' baptism. Now this is pretty awesome. This is where we see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit all show up to say, this is a real deal. This is what it's about. And we see this, that Jesus is acknowledged as the Son of God by the father that's in verses 16 through 17 it says as soon as jesus was baptized he went up out of the water at that moment heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of god descending like a dove and lightning on him and a voice from heaven said this is my son with whom i love with him i am well pleased in this passage we see the three persons of the Trinity. We see the three persons of the Trinity present and active. Again, God the Father speaks. God the Son is baptized. God the Spirit comes upon Jesus. We see this doctrine of the Trinity. We see it here. We get a glimpse of that. And we see that they are three distinct persons, but in essence, one. Now that is almost two too much for us to comprehend, but to know that this was the fullness of God, the fullness of the Spirit, and the fullness of the Father to reveal and to lead God's upper story of redemption. This is awesome. This is awesome. I wish I could have been there to hear God speak and to see lightning and the Spirit come down. I remember when I was ordained into ministry over 20 years ago in Rush County. I would have never thought I would have ended up here. I got baptized, not baptized, oh goodness. I got ordained into ministry at a small church, Hannigan, here in Rush County. And that was a big deal for me because that was where 
Jane's dad was the minister, still is today, where Jane's dad, Jane's grandpa was an elder. That was where Jane and I got married. That was where Jane grew up. And so it had so many important meanings on that special day. But the thing that meant most to me was my dad. Some of you have heard me talk about my dad. My dad is a character. If you ever meet him, you'll never forget him. And my dad has grown in the Lord so much. And it meant so much to me on that day that I was being set apart into ministry. I was being introduced into ministry. My dad said the closing prayer. And when my dad said the closing prayer, I'll never forget what he said. He said, God, you gave your son to die for me. And now I give my son to live for you. And he stood there and just weeped like a baby. He was saying, God, my son is yours. I send him with my blessing. I send him out to do your purpose. And that meant so much to me to have my dad speak that over me. But no greater introduction was received except when Jesus, the very son of God, the Messiah, the one who would be our forerunner of righteousness, when he enters into ministry, the heavens open up. And you could just imagine, they don't have boots, so they weren't shaking in their boots, but I bet they were shaking in their sandals when the heavens spoke and God said, this is my son whom I love and I'm well pleased. What greater introduction is there except God the Father saying, this is my son. This is the Redeemer. This is the Lord. So amazing what had taken place. Jesus is identified with us in baptism, shows us a path of righteousness, and Jesus is being authenticated by God the Father. The third thing that happens is the third person of the Trinity, which is the Holy Spirit. He is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Again, Jesus is a forerunner of our righteousness. How do we know how to be right with God? It's by following Jesus' example. But not only that, it's not just about being saved and and here I am baptized and I'm new and I'm washed clean, but it's now living a life of righteousness. How do we live a life of righteousness? I'm here to tell you, you can't do it on your own. It's only when God does it through you. It's only when the Holy Spirit lives in you and you submit to the Holy Spirit to produce the likeness and the righteousness of Christ. That's the only way. But what is so awesome about this is Jesus could have been empowered by the Holy Spirit at any time. Because he was God. At any time. But God's plan for Jesus to be the forerunner of our faith meant that at the very time we receive the Holy Spirit is the very time Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Was that for Jesus? No. That was for us. That was for us. We see in Acts 2.38... The Apostle Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of what? The Holy Spirit. The only way we can live in righteousness is through the Holy Spirit, the ministry, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we've got to learn to live in step with the Spirit. But Jesus says, To live righteous, follow this example. As soon as he's baptized, The Holy Spirit comes upon him. That was for us. And we see that fulfilling God's upper story in Isaiah 11, chapter chapter 2. It says, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of power, the Spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. Now this was a day to celebrate. But there was one who was not happy about this day. Who do you think was not happy about this day that the one that came to crush him showed up on the scene in full power and authority? The devil, Satan. Oh, he was not happy. The very one that was going to crush him was there. The very one that was going to fulfill God's upper story was there. And Satan wanted to do everything to derail that plan. And that's where we see what happens next. Because after Jesus is authenticated by God, he's baptized, authenticated by God. He's empowered by the Spirit. He's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. For 40 days of fasting and to be tempted. We see that the second point today is Jesus is proven to be the Messiah when he is tempted. 
Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, we see this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by evil. After 40 days of fasting, we are told that Jesus was hungry. You think? Some of you cannot go four hours without eating. Your dog doesn't even want to be around you after four hours. And Jesus, 40 days. If I skip a meal, I am super grumpy. I am agitated and it's not good. 40 days. So Jesus being fully man was all of a sudden being depleted of all physical strength, emotional strength, mental strength. He is at his weakest point. And who shows up to tempt him? Satan. Satan doesn't fight fair, does he? He waits when you're not expecting it. He comes and he sneaks his way into your life when you don't even know it's going on. He comes at your weakest point. You've just had a rough week. You've just had a loss. You've just experienced great pain. And all of a sudden, here he comes. He's coming after you because he doesn't fight fair. But we see Jesus as being our forerunner of righteousness. What does he do? He takes Satan on head on when he is at his weakest human position. He's at the weakest point. And he takes him head on. Why? For Jesus or for us? To prove he is the Messiah and show us a way to be able to live in righteousness and overcome the enemy. And that's what we see today. And the thing that I love, there's a passage in Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 that's important for us to understand. To be able to see this upper story and look at Jesus' ministry, we need to understand this. Hebrews 2, 17 through 18 says, Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. So when you are going through physical pain that you never even imagined, don't look to yourself for strength. Look to the one that faced physical pain beyond what we could ever imagine, and he overcame, Jesus. When we're in the darkest part of our life, we need to know that Jesus entered into darkness, and he is the light, and he led us to the other side. Jesus became flesh in every way so that we could look to him and see victory. We could look to him and cry out in his name and have hope. That we could look to him and we could see a path of righteousness. Well, today I want to quickly look at the three ways that Jesus was tested. Because this gives us purpose and hope. Because we are all tested in these same ways. And Jesus was tested and tempted and overcame so that we could, we could follow him towards righteousness. Let's look at the first one in Matthew 4, 3. Jesus was tempted to feed his desires. He was tempted to feed his desires. It says, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Again, Jesus is beyond hungry. 40 days, he is beyond hungry. And Satan comes to him, and what's he do? He attacks his desires. And he says, come on, you're the son of God. Turn these stones into bread. Feed your natural desires. It's natural for you to be hungry, Jesus. Turn it into bread. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was in that situation and I had all power and authority, I wouldn't worry about bread. It would be a Chinese buffet. There would be crab ragoon going on. There would be honey chicken. I mean, there'd be, I mean it would be a buffet. But he says to Jesus, go ahead. You can do it. Feed your natural desires. It's okay. But see, the thing is, is we all have natural desires, don't we? But we can go about it our way, which is really being led by the devil to say, you don't need God to meet those desires. But the truth is, is God has given us those desires, but he has called us to follow him and honor him and meeting those every need. Every need that we have is to be through God. We're not supposed to say my human flesh, my natural desires, it's over here, God, but I'll come over to you for spiritual things. No, because it's all encompassing. And that's what Jesus shows us. Jesus responds, I love, Jesus responds with scripture. Does Jesus respond to scripture for himself or for us? 
for us, to show us the way, because Jesus could have just spiritually punched him in the face and it would have been over. He could have. He could have called the, angel, the, the ninja angels to come down and karate chop him, but he didn't. Because Jesus showed us the way to righteousness. And so what does Jesus do? Matthew 4, 4, this is Jesus' response. He says, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus shows us how to resist Satan when it comes to our flesh. That we look to God and God's word to feed us. We look to God. The second thing that we see in temptation in Matthew 4, 6 is we see that Jesus was tempted to do his own thing. Satan's coming at him at another angle. Okay, I can't get him based upon he's hungry. Let's try something else. So what he does is he takes him to the highest point of the temple. And he says in Matthew 4, 6, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now, Satan's using the oldest trick in the book. Literally, he's using the trick that he used on Eve, where he took God's words and twisted them around. Thing is, Satan knows God's word. And Satan will try to use God's word to trick us, but he will omit truth. He will twist it. And this is what happens here. That he is actually quoting Psalm 91, verses 11 through 2. Satan is. And he says, for it is is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands. But he was leaving out the context and he was leaving out an important phrase because Psalm 91 11 actually reads this. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all things. The context is the writer of this Psalms is saying God will guard you in all things when you are following him. When you are living According to God's path of righteousness, when you're honoring God, God will send angels to protect and guide you. But what Satan is saying is, follow me. Follow me, Jesus. Throw yourself down. See, what's happening here is that we, Satan wants us to believe that if we do things our own way, if we do what we want, that God's going to protect us because he loves us. But I'm telling you, God is holy and God will not protect and God will not send his angels to what is apart from him. If we are living in sin, do not think God's going to protect you because God wants to leave you uncovered so you can be brought back to him. And that's what is happening here. He's saying, Jesus, go ahead and throw yourself down. And yeah, God doesn't want you to, but you got the power. You got the power. You know, whatever. Okay. But Jesus, here's Jesus' response. I love Jesus' response. Jesus answered him. It is also written in God's word. That was not for him. That was for us. Do not put the Lord your God to test. We can't say, God, I'm going to do what I want, but I need your blessing. No, we got to say, God, I desperately need you. I will follow this path of righteousness. And may your angels come and protect me. The last thing that we see is in verses 8 through 9. Jesus was tempted to go for the gold. Jesus was tempted to go for the gold. Matthew 4, 8 through 9 says this. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all of the kingdoms of the world in their splendor, and said, all this I'll give to you, Jesus, if you bow down and worship me. The thing we need to understand, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, says that Satan is the prince of the world. John 12, 31 says says that he's a prince of the world. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says he's a god of the age. You know, Satan, he's in control of the lower story. And he's offering Jesus, he says, I'll give you all the worldly pleasures. You can have it. I'm in charge of this lower story. But see, if Jesus would have done that, if he would have followed Satan, and if he would have chose to receive all of the world, he would have given up the upper story. Jesus would not have died for us. He would not have been the Messiah. He would not have been Savior of the world. We would be lost and going to hell. But Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus was true to God's plan. He did not lay it down to receive the world. But he laid his life down to save the world. And that is what, that is what God's plan was. But we see here what happened And for us, 
is that when that was said to him, when, G, when Satan offered that to Jesus, what was Jesus' response? Jesus' response in verse 10 was simply this. Away from me, Satan. In the fullness of man, Jesus showed us the way to righteousness to resist the devil. And then when Jesus, almost three years later, died on the cross and came back to life, he gave the final blow and Satan is defeated. The final blow and he offered us that victory because as we know, as it says in James chapter 4, all we have to do is resist the devil and he'll flee from us. Jesus showed us the path of righteousness. That Satan will come and try to de derail our lives. He will try to have us follow him. But through Jesus Christ, we can stand and say, get away. Through the name of Jesus Christ, I don't belong to you. That is the power of God. That is the forerunner that went before us and said... This is how you live through the power of the Spirit, overcoming the enemy and living in victory so that the world can see me. That's what we are called to. Now, just briefly in summary, Jesus pronounced to be the Messiah at his baptism. Jesus has proven to be the Messiah when he's tempted. And through his ministry, he proclaimed and fulfilled that which was of the Messiah. That which was of the Messiah. Jesus had the power to heal. Jesus had the power to cast out demons. Jesus had the heart of God. And Jesus showed the world through the beginning of his ministry. There is one way and it is through the Son. There is one whom we are to follow and his name is Jesus. There is one forerunner. And whether it's against sin, it is Jesus. Whether it is regarding salvation, it is Jesus. Whether it is regarding Satan, it is Jesus. And it is in regards to our life, it is Jesus. My question today, who are you following? Who are you following? Because we are either following Jesus Christ, our forerunner of righteousness, or we're not. It is not a gray area. And so I hope you choose today. If you have not accepted Christ, if you have not followed his example and have been identified and saved through his death and resurrection and baptism, don't wait. Don't wait. Jesus said, here's the path. And if you're struggling right now and you are letting sin have victory over you, let the spirit move in your life. Cry out and seek him. Let the word of God be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Let Jesus lead you today. Amen? Let's stand as we sing this song. Lord, I need you. There is one that we need. The forerunner, Jesus Christ. Lord, I need you. I need you. Every, every hour, I need you.